Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Randall Holcomb, Director of the University of Hawaii Cancer Center. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to the third of our Quest Starlight Lectures. Uh, tonight, we will be examining the link between cancer, overeating, and diabetes. It will be a great program. A few housekeeping details before we start. This program is going to be recorded and eventually posted on our website. If you happen to miss the first two of our Quest Starlight series, you can find them on our website at uhcancercenter.org. Please feel free to go and take a look there. Also, um, I would like to, to remind you that the chat function has been disabled for this webinar, but we will be taking your questions. There should be a question and answer function at the bottom of your screen, and you can use that to put in your questions and we will address them during the question and answer session. End of this session tonight, there you will see a link in the chat box for a survey. We would love for you to fill out the survey because we want your feedback and we want to know what we can do for you next time. So please do fill out the survey and you will re be receiving an email about filling out the survey uh, likely tomorrow as well. I'm happy to moderate this session. Dr. Joe Ramos, who is the deputy director of the Cancer Center and will be soon the interim director of the University of Hawaii Cancer Center will handle the question and answer session today. But we're gonna start out first with Dr. Gertrude Mascarinic. She is professor uh, of epidemiology and also associate director for education and training for the Cancer Center. And she's going to talk to us today about the link between diabetes and cancer. Dr. Mascarinic. Hello and welcome. I'm happy to tell you a little bit what we have found out about diabetes and cancer, primarily whether there is an increased risk for patients with diabetes. And are you putting on the slides or can't I see them, Hazel? Okay, very good. On this first slide, I just want to acknowledge all the support for the research for the MEC, many different grants. There's more than that, but I just put the major ones. And um, of course, it's a very large group effort to collect all this data. The objectives, the next slide, yes. The objectives were, I think, in your program, I, I'm going to describe the burden of type 2 diabetes in Hawaii, look at the role of obesity in these diseases and uh, present a few cancer sites that appear to be connected with type two diabetes. And we'll also look at cancer survival at the end. Next slide. So this is my basic model that uh, we're discussing here. So it's well known that obesity is a very, very strong, if not the strongest risk factor for diabetes. It's also a risk factor for several cancers, in particular breast, colorectal cancer. And the question that's being discussed in this presentation is whether diabetes is an additional risk factor to develop cancer in addition to the obesity. Next slide. Most of the data I'm going to show are based on the multi-ethnic cohort, many of you will know about the cohort already. It's been going on for more than 25 years and over 200,000 people filled out a very long questionnaire and repeated questionnaires every five years to tell us about their diet, their body weight, their medications and many other lifestyle factors. And the uniqueness of this cohort lies in the mixed ethnicities. So there's five major ethnic groups and half the participants live in Los Angeles country, County. Next slide. Hmm, something happened to that slide. Um, so 
one of the interesting features of this cohort is that the five ethnic groups have such different body weight and obesity as the very high um, excess body weight category is lowest in Japanese Americans and then somewhat higher in Caucasians and highest in these three other ethnic groups and in particular in women in African Americans and Latinas. Next slide. In the cohort, we've asked about diabetes reports. So the question in the questionnaire was, has a healthcare professional ever told you you have diabetes? And these are the results of the first three questionnaires. As is quite apparent that diabetes has increased with the aging of the cohort. And at least 20% were affected uh, in 2003 to 2008, and then later as people get older and come into Medicare, even higher rates have been reported. What's interesting here is if you look at the pattern with the five ethnic groups, that the pattern remains pretty constant over time and Caucasians having the lowest rate and Japanese Americans next, and then the other three ethnic groups have much higher rates of type two diabetes. Next slide. Um, it's um, the Japanese Americans are our largest Asian group in the multi ethnic cohort. This slide wants to illustrate that the other Asian groups also have a high diabetes risk. You see, Filipinos, Chinese, even part Asians have higher rates than Caucasians and Native Hawaiians also. Next slide, please. Even more interesting is when we look at admixture in Native Hawaiians. As you know, many Native Hawaiians have a very mixed ancestry and dividing the Native Hawaiian participants in a cohort by white ancestry versus Asian ancestries indicates that those with Asian ancestry have an incidence of 18 per thousand, whereas those with white is considerably lower with 13. So there's something about Asian ancestry that appears to be detrimental to diabetes development. Next slide, please. This becomes more apparent when we stratify the population by their body weight status. So on the left, the very lightweight people, the normal weight individuals, and on the right, the obese individuals. And you can see that within each ethnic group, it was in each BMI group, the Japanese Americans always have the highest diabetes incidence, and the Native Hawaiians are intermediate between them and the Caucasians. Next slide, please. The other factor that really influences diabetes incidence is weight gain. Weight gain over 20, 30 years, as you can see, confers a risk that is as high as 25 times higher risk for Japanese Americans who really gain a lot of weight since they were age 21. Next slide. I do want to mention that diet is also a risk factor for diabetes, although it has a weaker influence than the overall body mass index. Here is an example also from the cohort where a diet quality as measured by a DASH index confers a 20% lower risk of protection against diabetes for people who adhere to the diet. So that's the the number in the red box. Next slide. Dr. Le Marchand will talk more about this. Um, why is this high risk in Japanese Americans? And do we have an explanation? Just to show you two slides on this. There seems to be a big difference where the body fat is located and in people of Asian ancestry, there's more visceral fat like inside the abdominal cavity, whereas with Caucasians, 
more of the fat is under the skin, the subcutaneous fat, as you can see in my big blob. Next slide, please. When this, within a smaller subset of the multi-ethnic cohort, we uh, had data on the visceral and the subcutaneous fat. And if you look in the red box, that's again, Japanese Americans, the last line are the diabetes patients and they have considerably higher visceral fat than the people without diabetes. There's some trend in all ethnic groups like that, but again, it's strongest in Japanese Americans. Next slide, please. And so unfortunately that slide looks wrong on this computer. Um, there's some, Hazel, I don't know if you can fix anything, but there's all the stuff missing on the slide. Um, I'll just say what can be seen. Um, the question is how much does BMI increase breast, can breast cancer risk? And the bars, the lower bars in each group show for each ethnic group, how much the risk is elevated. And it means that Overweight women have a 21% higher risk to develop breast cancer, 1% higher risk. But this risk is particularly strong among Japanese Americans, which is the purple box. And the red ones are Latinas, and it's not as strong there. Next slide, please. It's probably going to be messed up too. Yeah? Sorry about that. We didn't test it on this computer. Um, then the same population where we looked at the obesity and overweight, we looked at women who had reported diabetes and their breast cancer risk 10 or 20 years later. And we found an 8 to 15% higher risk for the women with diabetes to develop breast cancer. And this is very much in line with many other publications. Next slide, please. Uh, someone put together studies from all around the world, from many populations, from many ethnic groups and countries, and calculated what the summary risk of diabetes and breast cancer risk would be, and they come up with a number of 27% higher risk. The other cancer, next slide please, that has been associated with um, obesity and therefore also of interest with diabetes is colorectal cancer. And there's a slight increase in risk from the 1.19 is that approximately 20% higher risk associated with diabetes to develop colorectal cancer risk and the risk is higher in women, so 28% versus 12% in men. Next slide, please. Um, two other cancers that have been associated with diabetes is pa are pancreatic cancer and liver cancer. And the, there the risk is actually higher than for colorectal and breast cancer, seems to be around a double risk. Um, among most ethnic groups. Um, noteworthy is, um, however, that pancreatic cancer and liver cancer are not as common as breast cancer and colorectal cancer. So although the risk is higher, the total number caused by diabetes would be not as high. The next slide, please. Again, someone put together all the studies or many of the studies that had been done to give an overview and list most common cancer sites and shows the gradient, how much diabetes may be related to cancer. So prostate cancer is not or even inversely associated. And on the top of the list is hepatic cancer, as you can see on the bottom, just as in our data from the multi-ethnic cohort, that seems to be above two, the risk. And breast cancer and colorectal cancer in between 
And there's a number of other cancers that also appear to be associated that type we haven't investigated in the multi-ethnic cohort yet. The next slide, please. At the International Agency of Cancer Research in Lyon, France, they had a very interesting project. They tried to get all the data for all the countries in the world to look at how much of cancer around the world is associated with diabetes and high BMI. And the third bar going down estimates the total number of cases, which is more than 600,000 cases a year that are attributable to diabetes and overweight combined. And the light blue are the high income countries. So it's obvious that the high income countries and the orange ones are East and South Asia. They contribute the largest number of cases um, due to these risk factors. And the next slide shows a map, how these cases are distributed around the world. There's differences between where the diabetes is the big problem and where the BMI is the big problem, but in the bottom map, um, it combines the two risk factors. And the estimate is that 5.7% of all cancers around the world are due to diabetes and high BMI. That means if we had no overweight and obesity and no diabetes, there'd be 6% less cancers around the world and mostly in the countries that are marked in red. So all the major ones in Europe too. Next one. So last two slides are about survival. So as you hopefully all know, many breast cancer patients are uh, survive their cancer treatments and have a long time to live afterwards. Um, but then it becomes important how the health status is. And on the right, there is the survival curve for women with breast cancer and with and without diabetes. And the top, the blue line shows the women without diabetes after 15 years, approximately 70% of them are still alive. For the women with breast cancer and diabetes, the number after 15 years is 50%. So this indicates the importance of having, uh, being in good health besides the cancer after a treatment and for survival. And last, next slide is on colorectal cancer. Next slide, please. Um, similar data for colorectal cancer patients and the survival, the patients, the colorectal cancer patients with diabetes have a 50% higher chance um, to die. But this is particularly pronounced in those who have had diabetes for 10 years or more. So it's a question of long-term diabetes and with all the damage that can occur in that situation. And the last slide, please. So in my conclusions, what I wanted to show here that overweight is really the most important risk factor for type diabetes. And you probably appreciated from the data how much more common type diabetes is than cancer. Um, it's really a very, very prevalent disease. And it's the prevalence is higher in persons of Asian ancestry despite their lower obesity rates. And Dr. Le Marchand will talk a little bit to that, why that is. And obesity is important for breast and colorectal cancer, as I mentioned, and having more years of diabetes makes it more likely to develop certain types of cancer. And the same is true for cancer survivors that are having diabetes along with being a cancer survivor shortens life expectancy. And we don't have the data for it, but we think it really depends on how well the diabetes is controlled 
not just having the diagnosis, but then how medication and lifestyle keep the diabetes in check. And finally, just to repeat, the prevention in diabetes is very possible. It involves weight control, lots of physical activity, and a high quality diet, besides medical treatments if they're necessary, but they're not actually necessary for all persons with that type 2 diabetes. And with that, I will end, and I hope you'll have some good questions when it's time for the questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Dr. Mascarenic, a wonderful talk. And we already do have some great questions uh, that uh, are in our Q&A uh, box. Uh, we will address those later. Dr. Ramos is going to run that question and answer uh, session. And I encourage you to put your questions in now, and we'll try to address all of them if we can, if we have time. Uh, again, I wanted to remind you to complete the survey at the end uh, of this uh, Starlight series, uh, these uh, series of talks today. And next, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Loïc Lemarchand, uh, who is Professor of Epidemiology and uh, Associate Director for Ethnic Diversity for the University of Hawaii Cancer Center. And he's going to talk to us about what we've learned from studies on overnutrition and cancer. Dr. Lemarchand. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, sharing some of our work on uh, obesity and cancer. So Dr. Mascarin, I told you about the relationship between diabetes and cancer, which is only one way uh, linking obesity, sorry, diabetes and cancer, which is only one way linking obesity and cancer. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about other ways uh, by which uh, obesity increases risk of cancer and talk to you about some of our research, uh, uh, specifically on fat distribution and, and cancer risk. So as you know, there has been an epidemic of obesity in the United States. Uh, so frequency of obesity has uh, doubled between 1990 and 2010. And moving to 2019, um, we now have about one third of US adults who are obese and another third who are overweight. So highly frequent and especially in the South, you can see the differences in frequency uh, with rates of uh, above 35% in southern states. So it's not limited to the US, it's also happening in Europe uh, and South America even, South Africa and uh, Australia. So uh, the reason why people gain weight is rather simple. Uh, it's just a question of energy balance. And if one eats more calorie than uh, he or she uses, uh, he or she will gain weight. And the reverse is true in terms of explaining why people lose weight. If they expand more energy than they consume, they will lose weight. And if the balance is, uh, is equal, uh, there is no weight change. Uh, this is a very simple concept. Uh, however, uh, the factors that uh, lead to obesity actually vary very much across individuals, as you probably know. Uh, and many factors are involved, uh, not only eating behaviors, but also some environmental factors such as access to green space to exercise or walkable uh, neighborhood, um, <clears throat> and also genetics, which play an important part as well. Uh, the effects on health of obesity are many, it increases increasing total mortality, uh, increases the risk of high blood pressure, cholesterol, type 2 diabetes, as you heard, coronary heart disease, stroke, low bladder disease, osteoarthritis, uh, problem sleeping at night and breathing uh, during sleep. And it also increases the risk of certain types of cancer, and I'll get back to that. Also has effect on quality of life, mental health, 
and difficulty in physical functioning. So you also cancers that are related to obesity. Uh, obviously the most common ones are breast and colorectal as we heard, uh, but pancreas, kidney and uh, endometrium is relatively common as well. Rarer are ovarian, uh, esophageal cancer, stomach cancer, and brain cancer, as well as thyroid cancer. So obesity affects the risk of many cancers, but uh, really uh, the number of cases due to obesity varies depending on the strength of the association and the, the frequency of the cancer. Uh, it's estimated that about 100,000 cases per year of cancer are due to obesity. Um, and about half of endometrial cancers, so uterine cancers are due to obesity with 20,000 20, cases. Where for breast, uh, it's only 70%, 17% of breast cancer cases due to obesity, but because of the greater incidence of breast cancer, it's responsible for 33,000 cases per year. Uh, so a great variation in terms of uh, impact uh, by cancer site. As you heard, uh, obesity is usually defined based on what's called the body mass index or BMI, which is really the weight in kilo above height squared. Um, and if you don't know your BMI, I advise you to find out, and there are many tools on the web if you go Google body mass index, you'll find many tools to compute it based on weight in pound and, and height in, in inches. Um, so obesity is defined by a BMI of 30 or above. Normal weight is 20 to 25 and overweight is 20 to 20. So it's a very common measure of obesity, which is easy to compute. Uh, and I guess it's useful to track. Um, because when adults gain weight, uh, they're, they're usually they don't acquire much muscle and what is gained is usually fat. So it's a way to track uh, body fat as well. But it's not perfect because weight doesn't differentiate between fat and lean body mass, which is muscle and bone. Um, so For a similar BMI, uh, you could have very different body types as represented here. Uh, Mark change in body shape, in muscle, and uh, fatness. So it has been shown for, for many years now that actually uh, people differ in, differ in the way they, in the regions, in the places in their body where they accumulate fat when they gain weight as adults. And uh, we distinguish two types of obesity, one which is more above the waist and one which is more below the waist. And uh, the one which is called central obesity, which is apple shaped, uh, is associated with a much greater risk of diseases such as high cholesterol, diabetes, um, and other complication I'm going to mention later. Uh, and really what it corresponds to is a propensity, propensity of accumulating fat inside the abdomen and it's called intra-abdominal fat or visceral fat. And uh, which has been shown and is quite remarkable is that this type of fat tissue is much more metabolic, metabolically active than fat which would be uh, on the limbs under the, or under the skin. Uh, and it's true because fat tissue is not just composed of, of fat cells or cells filled with fat, uh, but the, those fat cells actually uh, secrete some hormones, some being uh, going to the, the blood circulation and going to the brain for leptin, for example. And uh, <clears throat> leptin actually regulate hunger in the brain. So uh, that's an important feedback loop. Um, So an hormone which is secreted by fat tissue. Uh, but fat tissue is also uh, involved in 
uh, secreting or metabolizing estrogen from cholesterol, and that plays an important role after the menopause uh, when the ovary, ovaries do, do not produce any estrogen anymore. And finally, among the, the fat cells, there are some uh, inflammation cells, some uh, white cells, which most of them are macrophage and they secrete uh, other signals, signaling molecules that create inflammation, not only in fat tissue, but uh, all over the body. So it's a systemic inflammation, low level chronic inflammation, which uh, uh, is produce some complications related to uh, cancer. And I'm gonna discuss that in a second. So in addition to BMI, uh, waist circumference is used to classify risk. Uh, and if, you are, if your waist circumference is more than 40 inches, if you're a man or 35 inches, if you are a woman, you are considered uh, centrally obese and this increases your risk beyond the increasing risk due to BMI. And it's particularly important in this category of overweight, so not quite obese, uh, having your fat centra centrally uh, increasing your risk much, great, much more than, um, than if your fat is more under the skin or, or your, on your limbs. Um, <clears throat> so that's important again, because that correspond to, to some extent, to amount of fat which is intra-abdominally uh, abdominally located and which is much more metabolically active. So there has been a number of mechanisms to try to explain the relationship between obesity and an increased risk of cancer. Uh, as I mentioned, if you're obese, you have a certain amount of visceral fat, which again varies depending on the individual. Uh, your insulin is in increased, as well as other growth factors and insulin like growth uh, factor one, which is similar hormone of uh, producing cell division and multiplication. So those insulin uh, create insulin resistance and diabetes and is act activate uh, some pathways in the cell uh, which uh, control cell division and multiplication, so and survival. So clearly, those pathways are important in growth of tumors, uh, and um, have been shown to play a role in, in cancer. Uh, as I mentioned, obesity also creates chronic inflammation and it activate uh, increased expression of a gene to COX2, which um, activate signaling, prostaglandin signaling, which um, is related to uh, metastasis as well as growth of, of the tumor and is associated with survival. Also increases lipid levels um, and um, you have so an increase in cholesterol in the blood, but it also so which is just, as, as I mentioned, a source of estrogens. Cholesterol metabolites are transformed into estrogen in the fat tissue, but also in the, in the tumor, it can also uh, act as, as some metabolite of cholesterol acts like uh, estrogen and uh, increase the, the progression of the tumor. Uh, so if you think now of people who are mostly who accumulate their fat mostly in the abdomen, abdomen and have a lot of visceral obese, are viscerally obese. Uh, those mechanisms are enhanced and their risk of cancer can be expected to be greater than just for similar person with the same total body fat, same BMI um, as, a, as a comparison. And what we know of those mechanisms actually have open ideas about ways to ameliorate those uh, different pathways that would increase cancer risk. One is to control insulin resistance and diabetes by a drug which is called metformin, which has been used in diabetes a lot. There are others that are used as well. 
A statin is used to control co high cholesterol, uh, non-steroid steroid, anti-inflammatory drugs such as aspirin uh, are also used to uh, decrease chronic inflammation. But of course, weight loss would be the most uh, the best approach, which is upstream and would decrease all those uh, mechanisms. And I'm going to show you some work we have been doing uh, at the center, which is addressing more weight loss, uh, trying to find a, a way to decrease weight, but especially decrease visceral obesity. Other studies are being done in many, many places about in animal models, preclinical models, as well as in human now, uh, with cancer and biomarkers, if not endpoints yet. So it's still at the research stage, but there's a lot of um, studies being conducted in ways to decrease the risk of cancer associated with obesity. So the so studies we've been doing in, ha in Hawaii in the Mojetnik cohort study that, you meant, that Gertrude mentioned uh, are based on the idea that um, fat deposition, again, varies across individuals and carries different risk of cancer. And uh, both fat distribution pattern are different among ethnic groups. And those differences may contribute to the disparities that we see for certain cancer uh, in terms of risk and survival uh, in some of our uh, non-white groups. So what we did was to recall about 1,700 <clears throat> multi-ethnic participants, both in Hawaii and uh, in Los Angeles. Half the cohort is uh, in Los Angeles with African-Americans and Latinos, and the other half is here with whites, <clears throat> native Hawaiians and Japanese. Uh, so they underwent a DEXA scan, which is a low energy X-ray uh, <clears throat> to very well measure total adiposity, total amount of body fat, uh, as well as lean mass, muscle, and bone. Uh, and they also underwent an abdominal MRI to take a cross section of the abdomen and measure the amount of fat, which is uh, inside the abdomen in white or outside the abdominal wall, which is under the skin, which is here. And uh, just to show you again, this you know, incredible variation that we see among individuals and often between those two, those two ethnic groups here, uh, of uh, some individual having much for the same BMI, having much more visceral fat, <clears throat> so fat which is intra-abdominal, abdominal, uh, and other individuals uh, with, with fat which is under the skin and not so much inside the abdomen. So this, the fat here is around the abdominal organs or within the liver or pancreas or kidney. <clears throat> uh, and again, as I mentioned, uh, this visceral fat is much more metabolically active and uh, associated with increased risk of diabetes, greater increased risk of diabetes and heart disease and uh, other complications. So we then compare uh, the, the mean average uh, visceral fat amount across ethnic group, taking into account differences in total body fat. So it's considering people at the same level of body fat, if you want. And as you can see, the Japanese here have much greater level of uh, visceral fat <clears throat> than the other group in both sexes. And uh, African-Americans have lower uh, visceral fat. Actually, it's known that they accumulate their fat more under the skin uh, than within the abdomen. So what we did next was to, because we can't scan thousands and thousands of people, uh, it's expensive. We, what we did was to try to find a way to predict this old fat by measuring, of course, BMI, because it's a measure of total uh, adiposity, but also measuring some of those uh, biomarkers, markers that are associated with, with different uh, mechanisms associated with body fat, with obesity. And uh, we found a, like a mathematical formula that predict quite well visceral fat. Um, so it's measuring those particular uh, compounds in the blood 
uh, like lipids and uh, carotene, which is a carotenoid, which is which is stored in fat, that's why it's came up in our, you know, score, as well as some hormones such as uh, SHBG, sex hormone binding globulin. <clears throat> so then we went to the cases uh, of breast cancer in the MEC, as well as a comparable group of women that we took as, as controls. And we went to the to blood samples that we collected before we developed cancer and measure those biomarkers and completed the visceral score on them, visceral fat score. And we rank those women by whether they were in the lower third of the distribution or the middle third or the higher third. And we show that <coughs> compared to women in the lower third of visceral fat, those in the higher third had a 50% higher risk of breast cancer. <coughs> After taking into account differences in other risk factors for breast cancer, such as physical activity, family history of breast cancer, age at first birth, uh, is they use menopausal estrogens, how much we drink, number of children, et cetera, et cetera, including BMI. <clears throat> so it's really the effect of visceral fat in addition to all those variables, if you want. And remarkably, we found that in Japanese, this association was much stronger going with the, fat, but the fact that we have more visceral fat. And indeed, it's probable that certainly visceral, visceral fat is increase of obesity. And in Japanese, this accumulation of fat, again, occurs more in the abdomen. Uh, and so might increase the risk of breast cancer uh, more in that group than in other groups. And as we saw uh, in Hawaii since the beginning of the the Hawaii Tumor Registry in 1960, we have seen a marked increase in breast cancer rates in Japanese to the point that they have now caught up with whites and actually surpassed those rates. <clears throat> uh, in Japan, where there, is, there has not been much of an obesity epidemic, remarkably, despite some westernization of the diet, uh, but I think they, are, they remain quite active due to their lifestyle. Anyway, there's no real obesity epidemic in Japan. Um, I am told by my colleagues there, and uh, I believe that. Um, rates have increased. Um, also, it seems to be picking up uh, in recent years. So uh, this propensity of Japanese to accumulate fat in the abdomen when they gain weight, when they uh, are in a state of overnutrition, um, certainly in recent years, might have increased uh, trends in breast cancer in Hawaii. So in summary, uh, <clears throat> actually I have not seen, show you that, but Gertrude did, uh, we, we find marked differences in the uh, strengths, the strengths of the association between BMI and uh, various cancers uh, <clears throat> in the MEC. Uh, again, for example, for breast cancer, this association is much stronger in Japanese than the other groups. So to try to explain that, uh, we studied body fat distribution and found actually similar variation across ethnic group. And we were able to compute this visceral fat score measuring some biomarkers in blood and show that it independently predicts risk of breast cancer, uh, suggesting a greater role for this intra-abdominal fat, uh, certainly beyond that of total body fat. And um, this is likely to be explained by what is known of this visceral fat, which has a greater metabolic activity again, uh, suggesting that uh, approaches to lower risk of cancer uh, might focus on those pathways I just showed you, uh, using possibly some drugs, targeting those pathways, or even better by reducing weight. In, and you know, it's, uh, it's a very difficult uh, thing to do. Uh, it's not only hard, but it's certainly very hard to sustain. Um, <clears throat> so we are studying and going back to actually the first talk of this series of lecture, which was on, was on intermittent energy restriction. We are uh, conduct a, a feasibility study for conducting a larger trial that we now should get funded and start very soon to see 
uh, if intermittent energy restriction, which is so decreasing caloric intake by a large amount, 70%, two days during the week while eating uh, without restriction, a healthy diet, <clears throat> Uh, which we choose to be a Mediterranean, Mediterranean diet the rest of the week. And that for in our next trial, it would be for six months, uh, will preferentially reduce intra-abdominal fat. Uh, we have some data, including a pilot study, suggesting that not only to reduce weight, total body fat, but predominantly or preferentially reduce intra-abdominal fat. An advantage of this approach is why we're interested in is that it might be easier to maintain longer term uh, and so keep uh, results, uh, keep <clears throat> beneficial effect on uh, the mechanism I, I just described. So I'm gonna stop here and uh, we're gonna have time for questions. <clears throat> uh, so you are our collaborators on these obesity studies. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Dr. Lemarchand, for a really fantastic talk. And to uh, Dr. Lemarchand and Maskarenik, uh, I think uh, uh, I've gained a lot of new insights myself uh, into the relationship of, of body fat and, uh, and cancer incidence. So thanks so much for that. We are collecting questions. Uh, I encourage you all to continue to add questions to the Q&A. Uh, and, uh, and I'll help uh, Drs. Lemarchand and Maskarenik uh, uh, now uh, in reading through some of these. So uh, I. We have our first question is Gary Farkas, and he asks, have you partitioned out the impact of exercise on the development of diabetes obesity in your multi-ethnic study? Um, in the models that I presented for BMI and diabetes, there's always a physical activity variable in there. The thing is that these people, many of them are quite elderly and so the, the levels of physical activity are probably not as high as one wishes. And the other thing is that measuring physical activity is extremely difficult to get an exact account. And in this, for the cohort at the baseline, we had one page of questions. Just to put that in perspective, we had 20 pages of diet questions. So I think there's more to physical activity than we see here from other studies where they do interventions. They can really lower, of course, body weight, but also just glucose levels in, uh, in individuals with the propensity to have diabetes. Just the activity has an amazing effect on lowering glucose levels. Thanks. Um, we have an anonymous uh, inquiry. Uh, it's sort of a personal question. They had a relative that was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer shortly after receiving the first diagnosis of diabetes. And they're curious whether this is causation or correlation. That's a big question that actually is being researched. Our colleague at, US, at the University of Southern California, Dr. Satiawan, she's on the slide. So if, you, if we could send you the paper, but if you don't want that, we could also, you could just look it up yourself. Satia, Dr. Satiawan and Dr. Le Marchand is also an author on that, on the pancreatic cancer. There's a long discussion in that paper about the question. I don't think we're quite sure about that, so but it what, looks what, like there's a higher risk just yeah, what is, for getting diabetes. What is known is that so there is a risk involving having diabetes for many years, but also it is known that pancreatic cancer causes diabetes uh, in, in, the, in the like two years or three years or five years before diagnosis. So you may not have di diabetes and develop pancreatic cancer, but the diabetes you just uh, uh, was diagnosed with a few years ago was uh, due to the disease itself. So it's kind of a it's two, two sides of the coin. One is diabetes increasing risk for breast, for, for cancer, breast cancer in particular, or pancreatic cancer over many years. And the other is pancreatic cancer causing diabetes, uh, you know, two to five years before diagnosis. As, as pancreatic cells get destroyed by scarification of the, of the cells that secrete insulin. 
as it and the be. other thing the other thing I want to add is that um, of course type 2 diabetes doesn't have symptoms for a very long time people can walk around for 10 years without symptoms and just getting into a hospital for any reason and screening often uncovers several conditions at once so then it's really hard if there's any causality I and mean, even you know so if someone has has some symptoms of some kind and then gets checked through and then all these diseases may be uncovered that were there and nobody knows what came first so it's it's not always easy to determine causality thanks uh, we had a question about uh, what is putative. Uh, that must have been on one of my slides. And I apologize for using this word. Uh, it's just meant that it's not been proven. Still being uh, it's hypo an hypo hypothesis, really. Thanks. Uh, Mariana Gershenson is asking, what are the BMIs of the diabetic Japanese individuals who are developing cancer? I could look more in detail for you, Mariana. Um, I suspect they're just, I mean, they're just not all in obesity range. Basically, the development of diabetes is at lower BMI rates. So I suspect most of them will be between 25 and 30, but I could actually look in our big data set. And actually, very few Japanese reach with the obesity range. So just by the frequency of obesity in Japanese, many, you know, are in the overweight range. Yeah, and there's actually, and there's a lot of Japanese with what we call normal weight by that under 25, they also have diabetes. So there's no reason one can't have diabetes under 25. I mean, it happens in all groups, not, not in other ethnic groups, one doesn't have to be overweight. There are people who get diabetes, normal weight. Great. Uh, and Suen wanted to know if we can rewatch the recording of this, which is my opportunity to remind everyone that yes, this is being recorded and you can go and watch the recording in a few days. It'll be posted on the website at uh, uhcancercenter.org. Uh, so definitely you can go there and, and look at that. Uh, another question from Mariana Gershenson. Have there been any studies with GLP-1 agonists and cancer incidents? Uh, so that's diabetes medication, I believe. Um, so we have pre preclinical, a lot of preclinical pre studies that have shown an effect on cancer, protective effect. I don't know if there are clinical randomized studies, but we, there have been a lot of epidemiologic studies which are difficult to interpret because it's hard to, to separate the reasons for taking the medication uh, so the effect of the, of the disease from the effect of using the medication. But maybe Randy knows more about whether there are some clinical trials of diabetes, diabetes drug to prevent cancer, or at least to, to ameliorate some cancer biomarkers. Yeah, we, we oh, lost Randy, he had to leave the, okay. the meeting. I guess it's. I want to add one. I want to add one thing to the medication. There are different me diabetes medications that have been linked to lower high cancer incidence and to higher cancer incidence, as Dr. Lemarchand said about metformin. And then certain insulin preparations, new insulins, have been associated with higher cancer. But you always have to remember that the medication is so directly related to the severity of diabetes. And in case it wasn't quite clear with the risk factors, con diabetes can sometimes be controlled with weight control and diet and physical activity. But there's certainly a lot of type two diabetes patients with very serious disease that require a lot of medication and even insulin. And in those cases with a serious disease that cannot be controlled properly with all these biomarkers going and hormones being up, it's a different matter. And so comparing patients who take the medication to those who don't take medications is not straightforward because they're completely different. I mean, they, they're, they're metabolically different people, light versus a serious case of diabetes. Great, uh, kind of 
somewhat related. Uh, someone is asking, does uh, Wegovy, Wegovy, I'm sorry, I never pronounced that right, reduce visceral fat? And are there any studies that show a lower incidence of cancer uh, for someone taking this? So I believe this is a drug that was approved early in June, right? Uh, to reduce body weight. Uh, yeah. It's So it's really new. I don't think many, I'm not aware of it. There might be some preclinical studies that have been done or animal studies uh, with cancer as an endpoint. I'm not aware of the results. I'm sure people are gonna be looking at that, um, but certainly no human data, I would say. Yeah, it's probably a bit early. <laughs> Uh, we have another question, Edward uh, Filardo. Uh, he's asked, have you noticed a difference in exposure in environmental uh, toxicants, such as bisphenols and phthalates? I can never say that one either. And metabolic Sorry. disorder, <laughs> thank you, uh, for uh, fat distribution pattern and cancer. If so, is this different among ethnic groups? So actually, we have, we have a study of those compounds that uh, uh, break down uh, but breaking down from plastics, and um, we find a relationship. So it's, it is with some our collaborators at USC and UCSF, and we find an association between phthalates and um, and BMI. We are now looking at uh, funding to look at fat distribution. Uh, Seems to be very interesting to to look at whether it's associated with visceral fat fat in particular. Uh, and I don't want to get into the detail. The complication is it's only measured, measurable in urine, not in blood, and we don't have urine in our study. We only have urine that are collected 10 years before we, we looked at, we measure fat distribution, so it's a bit of a challenge. Uh, <clears throat> there are some differences among ethnic groups, but not marked, but we did find a slight increase in native Hawaiians, and I believe Latinos. Those data are not published yet. They are going to be published soon. And uh, if someone's interested, we can distribute the paper then. Okay. Uh, anonymous attendee said, very nice talks. <laughs> I agree. It looks like the Asians have a much higher rate of diabetes. What are the possible reasons? Well, as you saw, it has to do, prob our current hypothesis we're mostly researching is the body fat distribution. But there's, probably, there's not much question that there must also be some genetic component to this um, fat accumulation part patterns. I mean, as we all know, Japanese Americans in Hawaii don't ha have a fairly good lifestyle. So it's not just a lifestyle question that um, could, uh, could uh, ameliorate the situation. But I'm not... Um, do you know anything more about genetic predisposition to diabetes? In uh, well, I think the predisposition might be more to to visceral fat, to accumulating mm -hmm. fat inside the abdomen. Um, so we have been looking at you know gut microbiome, diet, and all of that, and we and some genetics. And so far. <clears throat> uh, we have been able to find one variant, genetic variant, which is more common in Japanese, especially of Okinawan origin, um, which is associated with visceral fat, but it's not a very common variant. So the, the caveat is that we don't have large number in our study, you know, to find what, those types of association, uh, those effects are very small. So you need large number of people and we are not, we, we are not in this situation yet. But I believe it's mostly genetic, I would say. There's also some, I've seen Japanese studies and they suggest that the cells that produce insulin in, in Asians function a little different. And, you know, in, yeah. as you know, people can have pre-diabetes for years and years and years and just produce more and more insulin. And there appears to be something that in Asians that is not, going as long as pre-diabetes thing that the cells producing insulin that they give up earlier and actually then it becomes more, then it becomes easier to detect. Great. 
Uh, one of our attendees wants to know how they can get more information on the randomized trial of intermittent energy restriction to reduced intra-abdominal fat. So when the trial starts, and I, we are expecting funding, but we can't really say we have it because we don't. Until we have the notice of award, we don't have the grant, but our hope is to start it uh, in early fall. If so by then we will be advertising, but if someone is interested, they can leave their contact information with the organizer of the meeting and we can follow up. We'd be actually very happy to follow up with them. And there is a pilot study if you're interested in the whole procedures and everything. There's a pilot study and there's a paper available that was published by Dr. Yes. Pernisa yes. is the first author. Great. Uh, Dr. Marana Gershenson made a note that I didn't catch until now uh, that GLP-1 agonists have been approved for weight loss. So she wanted to make that, that comment. Oh, good. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Anhee Lim, who's another researcher here at the Cancer Center for our attendees, uh, also made a note. Uh, she said, as for physical activity, what Dr. Maskrinik said is very true, that there are limitations to how accurately we can measure um, or how accurately people can report the levels of physical activity with questionnaires. But also for disease sometimes, uh, so for disease outcomes that have a very strong relationship with physical activity like dementia and uh, colorectal cancer, we see substantially protective effects uh, even with our questionnaire based levels of activities. So she wanted to make that comment. Yeah. Thanks, Anhi. Yeah, there is actually one, years ago we published one paper where we tried to look a little closer at physical activity and um, it was visible that there is an effect. It's just the BMI is, if you divvy up what we know about risk, the BMI is over 50% of what uh, is an attributable risk. All the others become smaller than that. Great. Uh, we have a member who's volunteering for future studies. Uh, so uh, they should be able to get in contact with you guys uh, at a later time. Uh, we have another member who says, in your views, is a diagnosis of pre-diabetes a meaningful one? And if so, in what, what, in what ways, other than the obvious, that it acts as a signal? I'll just say that, yes, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean there's I, actually, I, I've, the, the Diabetic as American Diabetics Association, I think was um, not quite um, decided on the matter how useful it is. I guess it's a warning sign um, and the limits are very low now. So if a doctor tells you pre-diabetes, it's a point in time where it's probably reversible for many people and it could be a signal just like a heart attack as a signal for some people to start using the stairs and yes and all the things that would control the weight and then they have a good chance that it never becomes diabetes but as i said there's also some cases that are just for whatever reason they turn into a serious disease. But one shouldn't walk around. I mean, I don't, I'm always cautious about these pre and whatever, because it's, there's no point walking around and thinking one is sick, a person is sick when a person's not actually sick. It's a, it's a warning sign that it could happen, but it may never happen. Uh, we have a, a question about medications that are linked to weight gain, uh, which then increases uh, mortality risk. Any advice about this iatrogenic risk, iatrogenic risk? For breast cancer treatment, that's a huge problem because several of the treatments for breast cancer have um, been associated with weight gain. And, and of course, often cancer patients exercise less than before. Um, and it's, it's, it's difficult, but the drugs may outweigh the adverse effects of gaining a little bit of weight, but it's certainly important to try to keep a balance there. I mean, the problem is, especially with breast cancer, since it's such a common cancer and women live such a long time with it, since the cure rate is so high that 
I mean, the, the, the obesity is from before, for most women is from before the cancer diagnosis, not for all. And then, then to change that after diagnosis and the drugs on top of it is, is a challenging problem. Great. Uh, we just have uh, two more questions. One is uh, from an uh, attendee. Living in Hawaii, we are we try to live a healthy lifestyle with the resources around us. For someone who's diagnosed with both diabetes and or cancer, uh, some believe in herbal remedies and medications to go along with Western medication. Some believe in herbal versus Western. Are there um, herbs or foods that you would like us to be aware of that interact with cancer or diabetes drugs in a negative way? I think it's a very difficult question to answer <clears throat> for many reasons. One is that, you know, both herbal remedies are not regulated. So content is not, uh, it's very valuable in terms of the active compounds, if it's an active compound. Uh, and there is no scientific studies, very few scientific studies of them. So it's really hard. I think there is a risk, there's no question. Um, and, and some are known to interact with medications. And certainly I would advise to talk to your physician about it. Um, before you, you know, take something long-term, especially if you are on the treatment for cancer. Yeah, while the treatment's going on, there are documented interactions with radiation and chemotherapy, so that to take anything else during the treatment period is, um, is more of a problem than later. Right. And, uh, and then our last question uh, from uh, Mariana Gershenson. What is the risk of cancer in bariatric surgery patients who lose a lot of weight? So there have been studies of uh, such patients uh, and uh, they, they've sh maybe four or five and they have shown a decreased risk of cancer over 10, 15 years. I mean, they don't, the follow-up has not been very long yet, uh, but uh, a decreased risk in the risk of cancer has been shown. And I believe it's more in one sex than the other. I think it's more greater in women than men for some reason, but it's being studied. <clears throat> Great. Uh, so that's all our questions for the night. Thanks to uh, both of you for fantastic talks. I want to remind our attendees uh, to please take the survey and uh, you, will, you will be uh, able to get a mahalo gift if you uh, take those surveys uh, for filling those out. So uh, do that. You also get something by email uh, in the next day or so. Um, and uh, I also wanted to alert everyone that our next uh, Quest for Quest Starlight lecture is coming up on, and that one will focus on pancreatic cancer. Uh, it will be on July the 29th, uh, same time, 5 to 6 p.m. So we really encourage you to, uh, to uh, take part in that as well. Uh, so with that, I thank you guys once again. Thank all of our attendees. I'm really enjoying these lectures. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll see most of you at the next one. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.